Good morning, East View. We're excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning. We're going to lift up an offering of praise. Invite God to inhabit that praise and make it something far better than we can create our own. Let's worship Him. We bring our praise. You bring revival. Lift our hands, you lift our eyes up. Where your love is found, there will be no fear. God, your kingdom come, your will be done here. On earth is in heaven, Spirit of God.
your presence we are free there's no better place to be there's no better place to be in your presence there is truth in your presence mountains move we forever run to you we forever run to you in your Yeah. 
that he will bring me home and day by day
trumpet sound and you'll lead us home riding on the clouds where we You may be seated. Well, we come around this communion table because Jesus is worthy. We come around this communion table because Jesus made a way for our lives to be restored through the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. This cup was costly. But I think that oftentimes we come to this part of our service and we just think, oh, it's, it's just another ritual, just another part of our service that we do every Sunday. It's not a big deal. We don't stop and reflect and remember the cost that was paid. And you know, we wouldn't be the first Christians to get communion wrong. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 11, the Apostle Paul, he condemns the Corinthians because he says, you're doing communion all wrong. He says, you guys, you're, you're arguing over who's most important. It's, it's causing divisions among you. You're, you're rushing through this. You're just in a hurry. It's just another ritual. And I think that we can be found in the same place. And we can think this is just another ritual. Paul goes on to say, and he says, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So let's pause today. What has Jesus saved you from? What has this cup cost? Would you join me in this ancient ritual that started on the night Jesus was betrayed and take the bread that represents the body of Jesus broken for us. Let's take together. And this costly cup that contains 
what represents the blood of Jesus that he freely poured out for us. Let's take together. Let's pray together. God, thank you for giving your son as a gift, as a sacrifice. The only thing that could be offered as the perfect lamb of God to restore us back into a relationship with you. God, would you forgive us when we act like this meal is more of a ritual? Would you forgive us when we hurry through it and when we don't really reflect on the perfect lamb of God that was sacrificed for our sins? So we remember, we give you thanks. We love you, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Uh, it's good to be with you, family and friends of Eastview Christian Church. So glad that you're here today. And uh, it's uh, good to gather and sing songs and take communion together. And that's what we do here every week. If you're here and you're brand new, welcome to Eastview Christian Church. We'd love to get to know, know you. You can text hello anytime you want to. That number on the screen we will follow up with you. Do not stay anonymous. We want to get to know who you are. Amen. And uh, all those watching us online today, we're glad that you're with us, especially our congregation in Hersher, Illinois. God bless you guys. We're praying for you. Thanks for being a part of us even so far away. Well, two quick things that are on my heart today before we get into the Word of God. We're going to be in Mark chapter 10. That's what we do here at Eastview. Uh, we get in the Word of God and let Him speak to us. But before we get there, a couple of things that are on my heart. Number one, the Preaching Institute breakfast. That's kind of the kickoff for our Preaching Institute. We're going to raise up another generation of preachers. That's June 18th. And you can go and sign up uh, right now, anytime. Uh, several people already have uh, at uh, uh, eastview.church slash preach. And who's this for? This is for anybody who thinks that they might want to preach. Just a small inkling uh, because that's often where the call to preach begins. The next thing I want to talk about is we're starting a series next week called Skeptical. We're going to look at the questions. We've been looking at the questions Jesus asked of uh, his followers. Next week, we're going to ask the, uh, look at the questions that were asked of Jesus, really trying to get to something to kind of trick him, maybe because they didn't believe. And so here's our chance now to address some of the questions maybe you have or your friends have about all things Bible, all things Jesus, stump the pastor. You can go uh, to, this, uh, to this number on the screen. I think it's 309-220-6122. Sounds like I'm doing a telethon now. Call now. People are standing by. But you can call that number and you can actually text your anonymous question and we are over the next several weeks are going to answer it in the service. We're going to answer it on an upcoming podcast we have going and some daily devotions and mic talks. So we want to answer the questions. Jesus was not afraid of questions uh, because he was the answer to all of them. So neither are we. So uh, please do that uh, and sign up for the Preaching Institute. We'll be excited about that. Well, listen, you might have noticed something different on the uh, table today. Uh, as I get ready to preach, I always have my open Bible because this is really the whole thing that I've got to say and, and anything I say outside of this doesn't matter. I've got my notes on my iPad and I also have, I have this cup. This cup, you probably recognize it. Most of you probably know it's a cup from Starbucks, not just any cup. This is my personal drink. This is built just for me, made exactly the way that I want it to be. And you guys, many of you have the same thing. You can go to Starbucks and you can make the cup, the drink, exactly what you want suited to your taste. There's boxes on the side. They don't use them anymore. They have a computer now, but they used to when you go in there. They have these boxes on the side. You can choose decaf. I don't know why, but you can choose decaf if you want. I need a little bit more than that. I need some juice, all right? And then you can, you, there's shots. You can determine how many shots of espresso you're going to put in there. That's a good thing, right? Uh, you, you, you can turn, choose the syrup. There's all kinds of different flavors. During Christmas time, I like the gingerbread syrup. Just squirt that in there four or five times. I want to taste gingerbread, all right? Uh, milk, you can choose soy or almond milk or half and half or skim milk. And finally, what is the drink? You have to name what this drink is. So what is my drink? What is my personal cup? What is the cup that I drink from every Sunday morning? Maybe I should use some decaf. I'm really talking fast right now. Here's what I drink. It's a quad grande Americano, double cupped with two Splenda and half and half. If I'm really on my game, I will take off the sticker and I will line everything up perfectly in two cups. That's called OCD, people. That's my drink. 
My wife uh, prefers a venti iced coffee, no classic splash of cream. One of our elders, Chad Parker, likes a quad salted caramel macchiato, non-fat, one stevia. I've heard some crazy stuff. Tall vanilla soy latte, three pumps, extra hot. Ice venti cappuccino, one pump vanilla, two pumps mocha, almond milk, light ice. What in the world? By the way, shout out to any of my baristas at the Morrissey uh, Starbucks that are watching right now, Abby and Maddie and Jada and Heather and Faith and Jesse. God bless you guys. Yeah, I'm sick. I know them personally. <laughs> They're friends of mine. <laughs> Starbucks touts that you can make 87,000 different combinations of drinks. You thought it was a coffee store. Have you ever gotten behind somebody in line with a list of these drinks? and they're ordering for like seven of their friends, and it sounds like you're in a foreign country and you don't know what the language is, I feel sorry. Sometimes you watch people who've never been to Starbucks watch, walk up to the counter, and they so, say something ridiculous like, I'd like some coffee, please. <laughs> and, the, and the barista's like, well, what size would you like? Well, large. Well, we have tall, grande, and venti. Tall is actually short. Venti is actually big, and grande is not that grande. It's really confusing, and I feel sorry for them, and they just they sit there and stutter their way through just getting a black coffee, please. Well, here's the deal that I'm talking about. I'm not promoting Starbucks today. Uh, I, am, I am promoting the reality that there is an opportunity for us to make a cup exactly the way we want it, and believe it or not, that's the sermon today in Mark chapter 10, because Jesus, sometimes we come to him and we try to take our Starbucks order into the Jesus following life and we say, can you make Jesus following just the way I like it to suit my taste? And Jesus says, well, I've got a cup for you to drink from, but can you drink from the cup that I'm going to drink from? That's the leading question today. So let's get to the word of God. I hope that you feel like you're up to date on Starbucks. And now I want to inspire you with the word of Jesus. All right, here we go. Mark chapter 10, verse 35. James and John, remember they're disciples just like us. They're Christ followers. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one on your right hand and one on your left in your glory. And Jesus said to them, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I'm baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant, for it has been, uh, but it is for those whom, for whom it has been prepared. And when the 10 heard it, they became indignant with James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so with you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many." Let's pray and ask the Lord if he has a word for us today. Lord, that's, that's the question. Are you talking to us? Is this for us today? Do we need to learn along with James and John? Are, are you listening to our prayers and watching our lives going, you don't know what you're asking? We want to be better followers, God. Those of us who have proclaimed you as Lord and Savior, we want to be better followers. So would you just give us another step today? Nudge our spirits, move us a little closer to you. And there are some people who don't know you, Lord, as Savior. They've not ever said, yes, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I pray today that just simply watching this conversation between Jesus and followers will help someone become a follower today. And so, Lord, um, you have to do all that. I can't do it. I don't have the ability. I'm not smart enough, wise enough, articulate enough. But, man, you move by your Spirit. And I pray right now you'll press into every heart here, every heart watching online, Press on my heart the words you want me to say. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Amen? Amen. Well, in this instance, James and John come up with G to Jesus and they customize their cup of discipleship. It might have been something like this. We'll take two kingdom come lattes, double pump of power and position, 
light whip, no sacrifice right now. And that's kind of what they're asking. They're, they're, they're coming to Jesus and saying, Jesus, we don't really fully understand who you are. We don't understand Messiahship. We don't understand what's going on. But here's what we know. Someday you're going to be the king, and we want to have prominent positions, one on the right hand and one on the left hand. And I think this is so 21st century. I really believe that we, sometimes we feel this way as, as followers of Jesus Christ, even in our lives today. We believe in Jesus. We want to be great in serving him. We want to go to heaven and be with him in glory. But we think that Christ is kind of like Starbucks. We just come to him and say, here's the way that I would like to follow you. We customize Jesus to suit our taste. And most often, it looks like the world, as Jesus points out. Here's the first slide. It's on your outlines if you're following along. The world defines greatness by position and power. That's greatness. You become great in the world by gaining some position of notoriety and having power over other people. That, this, this story begins with James and John making a wide sweeping statement. Have you ever prayed to Jesus? Jesus, verse 35, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What a bold request. As if Jesus is going to say, sure, go ahead. In fact, Jesus does. These guys are walking along the road onto whatever Jesus is going to do next after the miracle he's just said and what he's just said to them we'll get to in just a moment. But they have the gall to say to Jesus, would you do for us whatever we want? Jesus unbelievably and super patiently replies, what would you like for me to do to you, for you? It's an incredible thing. I think many of us feel that that's what Jesus is there for. He's there to say, hey, dear Jesus, and he goes, I'm listening. What would you like me to do for you? Well, I would like a serious dating relationship or I'd like you to fix my finances. I really like that job promotion or help us win this game, please. Could I get a new car? And Jesus is just up in heaven going, Sure, right, why not? No problem. That's how James and John are approaching this following Jesus life, as if Jesus is just someone to come and say, would you do for us whatever we ask? And their, their request eventually gets to this power and position request. Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Now here's the deal that you need to understand. I wanna, I'm gonna get to this question in just a moment, but What's amazing to me is the context of this question and this request. Here's the context. Jesus had just foretold his death, burial, and resurrection. He had just said to them, hey, guys, we're going to Jerusalem now. This is towards the end of his ministry. You guys have been following me for almost three years. We're going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be turned over to the authorities. I'm going to be mocked and beaten and, and uh, killed, and then I'm going to be buried, and I'm going to raise again on the third day. And just after that amazing statement, they go, okay, yeah, but, but can we sit on the right or the left? How insensitive. And in fact, it happens every time. These are the three instances in the book of Mark where Jesus foretells his death and his burial, his resurrection. In chapter 8, 31, you probably remember the story. Hey, guys, I'm going to die. I'm going to Jerusalem. They're going to capture me. They're going to kill me. I'm going to rise again. And then Peter goes, no, they're not. Over my dead body, Jesus. And that's when Jesus says, Peter... Get behind me, Satan. You're not thinking things like the kingdom is. Uh, Mark 9, 31, the second time Jesus goes, hey, death, burial, and resurrection, guys, I'm gonna die. I'm gonna be buried. I'm gonna rise from the dead. And then they're walking to Capernaum and they're arguing about something. When they get to the house, Jesus says, what were you guys talking about? And they, they were embarrassed because they had been talking about who's the greatest among them. And then here again, these yahoos, James and John, sons of Zebedee, also sons of thunder, they're called later, they have the nerve to come to Jesus after he said death, burial, and resurrection. And they've said, can we sit on your right hand and your left hand? Talk about insensitive. Hey, guys, I'm going to die. No, you're not. Hey, guys, I'm going to die. Yeah, but which one of us is the greatest? Hey, guys, I'm going to die. Okay, but can we have thrones next to yours? What a miss when it comes to following Jesus, that they would have this kind of reaction to what he's saying to them. Each time they're thinking of Jesus in worldly terms and seeking greatness in the worldly way. Guys, Jesus points this out to James and John in verse 42. Did you, did you hear his response when he calls everybody together? He says, you know that those who considered, are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. This is the worldly thinking. The world thinks in terms of greatness under power and position. Guys, we're kind of experiencing this in our own community. If you're not a part of Normal or Bloomington, Illinois, we have a new celebrity that everybody's is celebrating. Leah Marlene is her name. 
She's famous. She's a finalist for the American Idol. We shut down Uptown Normal for a parade for, for this wonderful lady, and I'm all about it. But I bet she has a lot more friends now than she used to. I bet there's people going, oh, she was my best friend in third grade. I bet. I bet. Because we love to be near people who are perceived as popular or famous because it gives power. James and John may say, I'm never going to be Messiah, but let us be right up there so people see us all the time. In a Gentile world, the concept of greatness always is power. Now, these guys might be asking for a place at the seat at the Passover table. They know they're going to Passover, and they're going, okay, we at least want to have seats at honor of this, of this, you know, this meal that we celebrate every year. Jesus, can we have the right hand and the left hand? That would be the honor place. It's like sit, be seated at the front table at the wedding reception, the bride and groom's table, not table 78 where I'm usually set after the whole thing's over, right? You ever been there? They want to be number one. They want to be seen. Maybe they're asking for this, but it's more likely their understanding of Messiah as the king. They believe that Jesus is going, look what they said, when you come into your glory, I'd like to think they're thinking about heaven, but they're not. They're thinking about his glorious conquering of the Roman government, and he's going to sit on a throne. They're saying, Jesus, when we get in that really cool hall of justice, and you're judging, and you're ruling, and there's all kinds of dignitaries around, can we be on stage with you? We want to be known. We want to be seen. He says, listen, that's the way the, the Gentiles do it. In verse 42, the first part, he says, Gentiles lord it over others. Gentiles are all about position. There, there's the Roman emperor. There's a very, very distinct order. There's the emperor, and then there are kings, and there are governors, and then there are uh, uh, legionnaires, and then there are centurions, and it goes all the way down. And every person who has a title, they can look down on the people beneath them. Have you ever been around someone who has a title? Maybe the title's on top, over you, leading you, and it's like you know it because they let you know hey, don't forget who I am. Don't forget. That's the way of the world. The world lords their positions over people, and they also exercise authority. It's a power trip. Often along with position comes power. G Gentiles, Jesus says, exercise authority. And uh, many things that we belong to kind of build into. Have you ever heard phrases like this? I'm the boss, or she's the boss, or climb the corporate ladder or the pecking order. All of those are indications that somebody above me, somebody who's in charge can tell me what to do and I have to do it. That's the way the Gentiles think. By the way, Gentiles are not just anti-Jews. The, the word Gentile is ethnos. It's the word we get ethnicity from. It means all the people, all the nations, the Jewish people were like everybody else, but guess what? The Jews were the same. Every one of us has this desire we think will be great if we get position and we get power. So we put letters in front of our names to indicate how smarter we are than everybody. I said it wrong. How much smarter we are than everybody else. And we put titles behind our names to indicate how important we are. Guys, this is world thinking. It's not Christ follower thinking. But it can often sneak into Christian understanding. I meet a lot of people who are ambitious for Jesus, but often ambitious for Jesus is just seeking power and position for ourselves. I think James and John were sincerely about Jesus. They just wanted a piece of that fame and that power and that position. And Jesus, I love the response. I wonder how many times Jesus responds to my prayers this way in verse 38. You do not, not, you do not know what you're asking. And that brings us to the Christ-following question. We went in this series, this is the last one today, where we've been saying these are leading questions. These are questions Jesus asked of his followers to help us keep moving along. And here's what Jesus says, following me is not about customizing the Christ cup to your taste. It's about drinking from my cup. You want fame, you want to be great, you want to be known. Here it is, here's the leading question. Are you able to drink from the cup I drink from? That's the question. You want to be great in the kingdom? You want to change the world for Jesus Christ? Are you able to drink the cup that I drink in verse 38? And then he clarifies it a little bit more. Are you able to be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? What in the world is he talking about? He's already been baptized. James and John have been baptized probably by John the Baptist. We've been to Jesus' baptism. What's he talking about? What well, baptism usually indicates death. In fact, in Romans 6, 3, we have this, this scripture that 
to be baptized with Jesus Christ. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? When somebody's baptized over here, we say death, burial, resurrection. At some point, at some point, the following of Jesus Christ means we have to drink of a cup that leads to death and sacrifice. Jesus um, asked the question, and they give a bold answer. Did you notice that? In fact, there's an old hymn that we used to sing in church growing up. Um, are you able, said the master. Are you able? And they said, yes, we are able. We can do it. Whatever cup we have. Now, they might be thinking about still the same cup. They might be thinking about the nice wine goblet that they're going to get in the, in the hall of justice when Jesus, I keep turning this into the DC comics, but anyway, the hall of justice, Superman's there, Aquaman, and then them. Uh, I'm fine. They're thinking he's going to be sitting on a throne, and there's going to be this beautiful gold wine goblet, and they're going to be drinking the best wine from Italy with Jesus at his side. Maybe they're thinking that, or maybe they're just thinking, we're going to be boys with Jesus. We're going to hang out with him. We're going to, we're going to party with him. We're going to sit and drink out of the same cup he does. We're so close to him. Jesus must love us better than everybody else. Our power, our notoriety, our position, our fame in Jesus' name. But Jesus is talking about a different cup. With our time left today, I want to talk about this different cup. See, because position in Jesus' eternal kingdom and power in Jesus' eternal kingdom, who becomes known and not known, who does big things for God and who does small things for a big God, who starts worldwide revivals and who brings revival to their small world, these things have already been determined. I just want to just, just, just slow us down just a little bit with our ambition to say, did you know God has a plan for every one of us in the kingdom of God? And sometimes it's big, sometimes it's small. And there's really not a lot we can do with it. I think when Jesus is talking here, he's talking about a plan that was before the beginning of the world, verse 40. To sit at my right hand or my left hand is not mine to grant. It is for those for whom it has been prepared. Hey, we came to the earth to save the world with a plan, guys. And if you're going to be on the right or the left, that plan's already been made. It's already been determined. I believe this is really important, especially for some of you who are younger in here and you want to do great things for God. In fact, some people will come to me sometimes and go, how'd you become a pastor of a church this big? I'm like, I have no idea. And if you spend five minutes with you, you go, he has no idea. I think it's just something that God did, and I tried to be faithful along the way. I think this is the point that he's trying to make to James and John. James and John, just be James and John. I got a plan for you. Can you drink this cup? I'm not going to give you seats. The question is, can you drink the cup? Because desiring the cup of position and power, even in Jesus' name, is not a kingdom trait. His cup is different. See, Jesus' cup, is defined by service and sacrifice. That's the cup that he's talking about. Now, you guys probably picked up this story. I always like try to find the story here. These guys are walking along. Jesus just said, hey, guys, really sobering moment. I'm going to die on the cross for the sins of the entire world. James and John come up beside him as they're walking on the trail, say, hey, Jesus, we got a request. Would you let us be number one and number two guy in your kingdom? And then when they get to the place, I'm sure they're eavesdropping, and Peter and Thaddeus and Matthew and them, they're going, what are they talking about? Hey, what are you guys talking about? And they find out they're talking about who's the greatest. I don't know how this went down, but these 12 guys were very close. I can see Peter shoving John. Who do you think you are? You're not that important. You didn't include me in this. I can't believe you didn't include me. I'm one of Jesus' best three friends. I can see them arguing with, with, with each other. You're not number one. You're number seven in this group of 12. Judas, don't even start. And they're, they're, they're having this argument about who's greatest. They get mad at each other because somebody had the audacity to think they're going to be greater for Jesus than them. After Jesus just said, I'm going to die. So if you've ever been a part of a family where the dad or the mom says at some point, okay, family meeting. And that's what it says here. Jesus says, okay. Jesus called them to himself and said, and here's the teaching. Hey, guys, it's different with the kingdom of God. It's not like the Gentile world. If you want to be great, look what it says. Verse 43, whoever will be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. Two very, very powerful words. 
The word servant is the word diakonos in the Greek language. It's the word we get deacon and deaconess from. Some of you came in that, uh, grew up in that tradition. The first servants in the church in Acts 6 that served widows' tables were called diakonos. Why is that? Because the word has to do with you tell me what you want and I do it for you. You say, I serve. In fact, it really became to be known as uh, someone who waits on tables. That's what the word serving means in the New Testament. The other word is even more powerful. It's the word doulos. It's the word for slave. Remember, one-third of the Roman Empire were enslaved, most of them to pay off debt. They were bound. That's the the root word of this word for slaves. Here's what Jesus is saying. You guys want to be great? Then you have to wait tables and bind yourself to serve other people the rest of your life. That's how you get greatness. (laughs) Are you able to drink this cup? The cup of servanthood and slavery? This is not a cup of here to be served, but a cup of here to serve. It's not a cup about who you are. It's a cup about everyone else. That's what Jesus is teaching us here today. Jesus even says the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And here's how the Apostle Paul described Jesus drinking this cup. This is how Jesus drank the cup. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That is the eternal view of the cup that Jesus drank. And it begins with emptying yourself. James and John, you can't drink from this cup until you pour yourself out and get over you. Now, if Jesus can be God in the flesh and say, you know what, I'm not gonna hold on to God. I'm gonna gonna relinquish my eternal heavenly powers to go and become human. If Jesus can do that, then how, how much more should we as his servants drink of this cup of emptying ourselves? And if Jesus can give himself to the point of death, how much more should we sacrifice so that we can be great in the kingdom of God. Guys, listen, this goes on to say, you know how this works. This is the reason that he became the name that is above every other name. What's the greatest name in the world? The name is Jesus. You've sung about him. You've remembered his death, burial, and resurrection today. Why is his name so great? Because he served and sacrificed more than anybody else. That's the way to greatness. That's what he's trying to teach them. And this is the cup that we're learning here at Eastview Christian Church. We're learning how to serve others in Jesus' name. This is what Love McLean County is all about. We want to be great, a great church for this county. And you know how we're going to do it? We're going to serve. And we're learning. And many of you already are serving in great ways. I want to take a few moments here just to celebrate what God's doing at Eastview Christian Church. Thousands of you are becoming great in the kingdom because of your service. We have people who stock the food pantry every week and they take out the trash and they sweep the floors and they clean toilets. They set out traffic cones even this morning and they they do this until their arms hurt and they organize parking. They set up chairs and tables and take down chairs and tables and set up chairs and tables and take down chairs and tables over and over and over again. There are people who are sitting on the floor right now teaching children. They're rocking and praying over babies in the nursery. They're changing diapers. They're changing diapers. There are people who clean the kitchen and clean the toys and wash the baptism towels. There are people who manage East Fuse money and count it and invest it. There's hundreds who lead and host small groups every week. Others who give tech support. There's some who are in a sewing circle making quilts for people who are shut in. There are people who write cards to people who are in the hospital, who are sick, who have gone through something hard. There are people who visit jails and visit hospitals and visit nursing homes. They put an arm around the down and out and they pray for the up and in. They chat with people online. They make videos. These servants run cables. They practice instruments so they can sing on Sunday. They practice vocals so they can sing. They design logos and backgrounds and shirts and T-shirts. They plan funerals and weddings. They text students. They give students in high school their number so they can talk to them during the week. They pray with them. They go to camp with them. They sleep in crappy beds with them so that they can maybe hear a word from Jesus Christ. They stay at camp. They make sure mechanicals run. 
They greet people. They run info centers. We have security. They prepare food. They prepare food. Have you had the breakfast pizza? I say all the time, we don't have special sauce at Eastview, but Cafe 19 does. They pray with hurting people. They walk alongside recovering addicts. They tutor elementary school kids. They pack backpacks so kids can eat. They babysit, run errands, and provide transportation for single moms. There are people here who paint, fix cars, patch roofs, help stranded motorists. They buy coffee for homeless people. They donate diapers. They write lessons. They turn on mics. They set lights. They program computers. They keep computers ro uh, running. They turn it, uh, post it note scribbles into readable documents. That's my administrative assistant, Laura. They produce videos, they edit books, they grill hot dogs, they host in the family room. Guys, I literally could go on and on and on. Eastview is a place where you serve. And I just want to take a moment in the middle of this serving, this cup of serving and sacrifice to say to all of you who serve, thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you for what you do in Jesus' name. Because listen, most of the time it's out of sight and no one notices and you don't get a title and there are no seats of honor, and often you're not recognized after years and years of serving. But here's what I want to tell you today. If you are serving in any way, in any capacity, you are great in the kingdom of God. And he, Amen? Yes, we can clap for that. And I want to thank you. I want to thank you for what you're doing in Jesus' name because that is how the church keeps going. And you might say, well, there's service outside of the church too. It's right. It goes both together. Galatians 6.10 says that we should take every opportunity to serve those who are in need, especially those who are the household of faith. It's not bad to serve in the church, but we shouldn't keep it here. That's what Love McLean County is about. We are going to serve until the whole county knows that we love Jesus. We're going to become great, not because of big church, not because of cool programming, not because of anything else, but because of the way that we serve other people. Amen? Amen. And guys, listen, I'm glad you're saying amen because the cup of service always leads to sacrifice. It's going to cost us. It's going to cost us time. It's going to cost us energy. It's going to cost us weeks we'd rather be traveling. It's going to cost us money. And of course, Jesus' servanthood led to the ultimate sacrifice. He died. The whole story of Scripture helps us understand this cup. I want to spend some time talking about the cup. And if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, really, would you just tune in right now? because this is why you need Jesus Christ. It has to do with the cup that he talked about drinking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink from? This first scripture is Isaiah 51, 22, that it talks about the cup of the wrath of the anger of God against sin. Now, if you're not a follower, you're probably going, what's God so ticked off about all the time? Here's what he's ticked off about all the time, is that he's righteous and our sin has polluted this world with every bad thing. And there is wrath coming against sin. And you might say, well, that's not very nice. Well, listen, don't the atrocities of this world make you just a little mad? Don't, didn't the shooting last week in Buffalo make you mad? Doesn't an abused child make you mad? Doesn't an abused wife or mom just bring anger? Doesn't racism, racism tick you off? Doesn't war in Ukraine make you a little mad? When they shot up a church last week in LA, doesn't it make you, isn't there a sense inside of you that goes, that's not right? Yeah. And you're not perfect, <laughs> and you're not God. Can you imagine if you were perfect, how ticked off you would be at the mess of sin in this world and the wrath that you would pour out? Guys, this is justice. Eventually, God is going to pour out this cup of wrath. It's in the Old Testament all the way through the book of Revelation. In the end, there is a cup of wrath of God for judgment for the sins of the world. I can't sugarcoat that. But here's good news. Jesus decided that he would drink that cup. It's a bitter cup. M Matthew 26, 39 tells us that Jesus is praying, Lord, please, <laughs> if there's any way else, Father, let this cup pass from me. It's not an easy cup. It's not a tasty cup. It's not a, a designed cup for your taste. It's one that tastes terrible because it literally is the wrath and the sin of all the world for all time. And Jesus is saying, Lord, if there's any other way, Take this cup from me. But in John 18, 11, when Peter starts swinging swords, 
Jesus says, put that sword away, Peter, because here's the deal. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? He willingly went to the cup and he drank it. This is what he's saying in verse 45. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Here's the good news. The cup of my sin, Jesus drank it so that I wouldn't have to. And this last one is the one that Nikki referenced in the communion meditation of the day. There's a cup of blood that covers my sin. It's why we remember every week around here because we want to remember that Jesus has taken my sins away. And here's the deal. If you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, you're going to drink some cup. You're going to drink the cup of vengeance and anger and wrath against the sins that you've committed like the rest of us have. Or you're going to drink the cup of blood, the forgiveness of Jesus Christ that washes your sins away. And our prayer for you today, text hello to that number right now. We want you to come to faith in Jesus Christ. And once we, bring, once we drink that cup of blood that represents Jesus' service and sacrifice, then we begin to drink the same cup. The cup of Christ is filled with service and sacrifice, and it's the way to greatness in the kingdom. Maybe you guys know the end of the story. James was the first apostle who was killed for his faith in Jesus. James, the brother of John, who said, hey, can we sit the right hand, the left hand? Jesus says, can you drink the cup? And yes, we can. He goes, you're going to drink the cup. And within the early first month or year of the church, James was beheaded by Herod. He drank the cup. His brother John was the only apostle that we know of historically that lived his entire life into the 90s, the first century. But he ended his life in exile because of his faith, an old broken man. Guys, listen, here's the deal. I'd like to say that if you just give your life to Jesus Christ, it's going to be easy street, and it's going to be just customized the way I want a little answered prayer. I want a little love. I want some ease in my family. I want financial prosperity. That's the Jesus drink I want. It's not how it works. The Jesus drink, the cup that we drink from, is always one of service and sacrifice. May we be the kind of disciples who get rid of the customized cup we have and drink the cup of Jesus. Amen. Before we move on, I wanted to ask this question. What in your life needs to change so that you can drink the cup that Jesus has offered you? You know, Mike said it a couple of times, maybe you don't actually follow Jesus, but you're ready to today. Or maybe you've been following Jesus for a really long time, but you've let a lot of stuff get in between you and him in between your relationship. We wanted to give space this morning. I'm gonna have some people go ahead and come up to the front of the stage who are, are gonna be willing to talk with you or pray with you. If either of those categories is you, whether you wanna make a decision for Jesus or if you just need to talk to somebody, you just need to confess some things in your life that you need to surrender, that you need to lay down because that's one of the constants of the Christ following life is surrender. And we didn't wanna move from this space without offering that because we all have something. I have things that I need to surrender on a regular basis to the Lord. But there's something so sweet about laying down our customized cup and taking up the one that the Lord has offered, has offered us. So we're going to sing, and you have permission to, to come up if you'd like to and talk to some of these people, or if you just want to stay in your seat, if you need to pray, if you want to talk to the person next to you, you have freedom to do that.
changing heart when the good days and the hardest part I believe and I will follow you I believe and I will follow you when I see the wicked prospering when I feel I have no voice to sing even in the
Amen. You all may be seated. Well, last Sunday um, was a really special Sunday. Um, we have a, a child dedication. And uh, I think we have a picture of what that dedication was. In fact, we had so many families respond that we had to move the venue into here for all the families to be able to come forward. And it was such a beautiful sight. It was a beautiful service. And I just want you to know that we're able to do that because of your generosity. Every week when you give to Eastview, you are giving to all kinds of ministries. And we had almost 80 children that were dedicated last week and whose families came and said, we want our kids to know Jesus. And you have a direct impact in that. And so we want to thank you for that and um, just encourage you to continue to give. Because just like Mike was saying, um, we have sacrifice. Being a Christ follower is sacrifice. Raising your kids to know Jesus is a sacrifice. So thank you for your generosity. Um, you can give two ways. You can give in the boxes in the back on your way out or you can give at eastview.church slash give. So thank you again for your generosity. I have a few family announcements for you. First of all, if you're new today, if you're watching us online, if you're here in person, for the very first time, we want to give you a special welcome. We're so glad that you're, you're joining us, and we'd love to meet you. We know this is a big place, and so there are two ways that you can introduce yourself to us. You can text us hello to the number on the screen, or um, if you're here in person, we'd love to meet you in person in our family room. And our family room is on the lower level, right across from the cafe. And we have a team of people that are ready to meet you, um, connect with you, help you with next steps. And uh, hope that you will, you'll do that if you're new. We also have a gift for you, so don't miss out on a special gift if you're new. Uh, we have a program called Starting Point. It is newer around here, um, but you don't have to just be starting at Eastview. Over and over again, I run into people and they say, I've been at Eastview for 10 years, and it's kind of like the confession. Um, I've been here for a long time. I'm sorry. I never did the text hello or family room. I'm sorry. So that's okay. That's all right. We just, we want to help you get involved. We want to help you take your next step. And so that's what Starting Point is all about. We want to help you to find your people and places. And so it's a three-week series. The first session, Mike teaches, so it's a good time to hang out with him. The second week is taught by our small group team, and we talk about how to get into community, how to find a small group. And then the third session, we give you a behind-the-scenes tour, which is really fun to see. Go backstage, see fun places that you'd never see otherwise. Um, but bottom line, if you're not involved, if you're not connected, if you're not serving like Mike talked about, that is for you. And that will start on Sunday, June 5th. And so we'd love for you to register all that information, plus lots more, is in our e-news. And if you didn't get the e-news this morning, it's our digital, um, digital bulletin emailed to you. Um, you can scan the QR code on the back of your chair right now to receive that, or you can subscribe at eastview.church slash e-news. There's all kinds of information, announcements, things that we don't have to have time to share from stage. Um, Mike's going to be starting a new podcast. Um, you want information about that. And um, there's a Meyer Simply Give program that's starting. And all that information, don't miss out. Make sure you read the e-news every week. So it's been great to be with you today. Um, next Sunday, we'll be starting a brand new series called Skeptical. And um, Mike mentioned that a little bit earlier, but we want to hear your questions. He said, stump the pastor. So there's a number, I think, on the screen that you can text your questions to um, because we want to know, what are you skeptical about? It's okay to have questions and doubts. And so uh, we hope you'll join us next Sunday for that next series.
And again, if you are moved, if, if you just didn't want to come forward um, during the service, we'll be down front here. Um, so invite you to do that. Come forward and um, we want to pray with you if God moved in your heart this morning in some way. So, so good to be with you today. We hope to see you next week. You are dismissed.